But I mean it, and I'm so happy you're here today. I'm happy you joined us online. And uh, man, we are in the summer, and when we are in the summer, uh, it's on. I mean, there's a competition for what you're doing, what you're thinking about, uh, and we're still growing. We're gonna grow all summer long. Remember, I promised you in January that if you continue to follow along, whether it be here in person, preferably, or online when you're vi- or traveling or doing other things, uh, that you lean into the devotions and things that we're doing during the week, uh, and you allow God to change you, that he will create in you a different person, a new person. He'll change the way you you think. And that's what's been happening to you guys, to us as a church family. And I'm so excited about it. We're going to continue for, uh, this is the second to last week. We have two more weeks, uh, our series on love, love intentionally. Today, we're talking about not delighting in evil, but rejoicing in the truth. And it's going to be a good one. And I will confess to you once again, that it's one that's had me really thinking this week. Now, this is the reason it's had me thinking. Every week I tell you, uh, probably every week, tell you how I'm not great at this stuff. And it's not because I'm comparing myself to you. It's because I'm comparing myself to Jesus. And I hold up these 15 different descriptions or characteristics of agape love in light of my own life. And I look at where the flaws are and it convicts me. And now if I'm comparing myself to you, I may win. Perhaps you may win and be more loving, but I'm not. I'm comparing myself to Jesus. And when I do that, I find myself wanting. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, was writing this 15 description or 15 faceted uh, conversation about love to a particular church. And they held it up in light of their church. And they said, this is where we're lacking and this is where we need to change. So we do the same thing. So love does not delight in evil. It rejoices in the truth. And we're going to read 1 Corinthians 13 again for the second to last time for a while. And I hope that it has taken a permanent home, a residence in your heart. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Oh, it's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. That's underlining in bold on purpose. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's where we're going to be next week. Love never fails. So today we're going to talk about love and how love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So really what this means is that love does not make those things that are wrong appear to be right. That agape love is the love of commitment, the love of permanence, not based on circumstance or feeling. That when you love, you choose to love because it's the right thing and you do it as long as it takes, no matter what it takes, because it's how God loved us. And so when the Bible tells us not to delight in evil, that love does not delight in evil, but delights in the truth, the first half of our time together, we're going to spend talking about how we are not to be people who delight in evil. And I'm going to break down two ways that we normally do that. One would be a way that we delight in evil and it's a direct insult to God. The second is a way that we delight in evil and it really destroys us and our own personal walk with Christ. And you may say that I don't delight in evil, that I don't like sin. Well, I would say to you that none of us like the idea of sin, but even though most of us or many of us in here are believers in Jesus Christ, we've become Christians and followers of Christ, there still lives within us in the dark places a magnet that draws us toward something in our life that is set to destroy us. The Bible says Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour us, that he has schemes and plots and ploys and plans, and he wants to destroy you, to divide you from your relationships and your purpose, and to keep you from understanding the reason that you were put here in the first place. In your devotionals on the very first day on Monday, we're going to talk about sin. I'm going to define it for you. You're going to get a little theological. We're going to discuss where it came from, the impact that it had on us and why we should hate it. Then we're going to talk about um, developing the theme. We're going to talk about some of the things we're going to discuss today. And each day we're going to break them down in a five to eight minute segment where you'll be able to follow along. And the sermon, this teaching can continue to live in your heart all week long. 
and God can continue to change us. I hope that you're participating in that. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands if you're participating in that or not, but I hope that you're following along with the devotions. If you don't have the church app downloaded uh, and don't get the push notifications, you can get a PDF file uh, off of a QR code that will be behind me at the end of the service or any of our social media outlets on our app on our website, and I encourage you to follow along. I've also audio recorded again this week, those devotions for those of you that don't like to read or in your car, trying to make it as easy for you guys as possible to follow along and to grow. Where do you get your truth? That's what I wanna know. I was talking to a good friend just a minute ago and they're going on vacation and they're like, I ask Facebook, um, you know, what's the best thing for me to do, you know, at this particular city on vacation. And we were laughing at some of the answers they got. You ever done that? You ever wanted to get some truths? You just throw something out onto the interweb and you just hope that people are going to respond with intelligence. You know, you throw out a question about a diet tip and you get all kinds of people who respond. And what do you do? The first thing you do is check their profile going, nope, not listening to that person. You know, you ask for, you know, advice on where you're going to travel or where you're going to eat or where you're going to take the kids. And you get people, I mean, they're just all kinds of people with opinions. You get truth from your family. You get truth from your friends. You get truth from the things you formerly believed. But we're going to talk today about where we get our truth. Before we do that, though, let's talk about two ways that you and I might find that we delight in evil. I trust that we've decided that we're not going to sin that if there are things in our life that we know that are displeasing to God, actions, thoughts, and attitudes that we know are there that shouldn't be there, we've decided that we are going to get rid of them. Even if we struggle with them, you and I would agree, this can't be there, it's gotta go. But maybe there's a way where instead of it just being black and white, sometimes we just enter into the shades of gray and we find ourselves kind of being drawn toward evil, toward iniquity, toward sin. One of the reasons that we don't want to be delighting in evil is because it's a direct insult to God who loved us and loved us so much that he gave Jesus for us who died on the cross to provide the way for us to have eternal life. And one of the things that we can do to honor God is to honor the people that God created. And one of the ways that we can dishonor God and delight in evil is to delight in the evil that exists within the people that God created. This may not seem like a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to God as evidenced in so many places, particularly in the book of James, where this theme is written about, but it's gossip. And Christians are famous for it. Well, we say because it's true, it's not gossip. That's not true. It is gossip. Gossip is taking the vice of somebody else and living vicariously through them. It's taking someone else's sin or shortcomings and sharing it with somebody else and literally delighting in that. The book of James tells us that it's a big problem. The book of James in James chapter one says, if you think you're religious, you think you walk with God, you think you're a follower of Christ, but your mouth is out of control, then your life is a slap in the face of God and religion and Christianity is probably not in you. In James chapter three, verse five, we see that a tiny spark can set a forest on fire and among the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body and it can set your whole life on fire for it is used or like the fire of hell itself that when we choose to share things about people, whether it's slander, something that we know is true, but we're using to hurt them, whether it's just a rumor where we're not sure that it's true, but it's just too good not to pass on, whether it's just joking, not joking, like, you know, well, I hope they finally get out of bed today long enough to get something done. Whatever it would be, for some reason, there's something in us that Satan just uses and pulls out in us that makes us wanna tear other people down. And it's a direct slap in the face of God. It's an insult to God because he cared so much that he created us and wants to have fellowship with us, wants to know us. And for us to steal and destroy the reputation of somebody else, whether we think it's true or not, not only is none of our business, but it makes it God's business. And he promises to deal with us if we don't get it under control. 
Now, this gets in your business right away. I understand it gets in mine right away because again, there are things in us that Satan uses to pull us towards sin that, that linger there that we don't want there as the Holy Spirit moves all of this stuff out because the Holy Spirit permanently lives within us, but yet we battle against it. So that's something that we have to guard against. If you're tempted to say, well, I don't delight in evil. Of course, I don't delight in evil. Sometimes it may not be the evil you're doing more than it is the evil that you're hearing or that you're sharing. And that made me think this week, wouldn't it be great if my words were used to build up, to edify, to bring grace, to leave truth? and not to tear down, to bring suspicion, to divide? Well, that's up to you to think about, and it is in your devotions this week, so if you're following along, you'll have an entire day to focus on this. Now, there's a second thing we have to be concerned about. It's not just that sin itself and delighting in evil is an insult to God, but it also is an evidence that there's something wrong between a person and God. There's something wrong deep down in our soul, in our spirit. First of all, if a person is living in sin and has never confessed to their sin, believed who Jesus is and decided to become a follower of Christ, then that person's not a believer and that person is in danger of the fires of hell after death. The punishment that comes from the curse that Adam and Eve brought on in the Garden of Eden, the punishment which price Jesus paid on the cross as he died for our sins and rose again, but it's nothing to be laughed at. It's nothing trivial. Sends a death sentence in its original form without intervention. Sin in the life of a believer, you and I, indicates there's a separation between us and God, which usually results in a separation between us and the people closest to us, our church family, and ultimately in the people who God wants us to influence. And we have to be really introspective and sensitive to the Holy Spirit because we get legalistic, judgmental, holier than thou, and super hypocritical when we start to talk about these issues. These are very personal things. And I was thinking about this this week. If I'm not actively participating in something that would be considered sin, which, you know, I guess on a day-to-day -day basis, there are little sins, there are big sins. All of us have issues and struggles. Am I delighting when somebody else sins? Am I lingering in that? Am I tracking along with that? Is it too close to me? Or more specifically, am I too close to it? I live in a world that doesn't share the same values that I share, that doesn't believe the same truth that I believe. And almost everything that we encounter outside of what we're doing right here and what you do in your own personal time to grow in your relationship with God is in some way set up in opposition to who we are as followers of Christ. Does that make sense? So you're kind of living in a war zone. And that's not a stretch, it's what scripture teaches. And you're under attack. You're under attack from the things within you that draw you toward sin, which separates you from God and from the people closest to you. It kills your relationships and destroys your witness. And Satan's out there with the perfect fishing lure, the bait thrown in your pond, waiting for a moment of vulnerability, poised to attack. So we have to be vigilant. One of the things I was thinking about this week is am I delighting in the sin of others? Now being around it, being among it, in the world, inevitable. But the Holy Spirit will tell you in your own heart, if you're too close, what your response or your reaction is. Many, many ways we could apply this. I'm only gonna apply it in one. Are you willing to do an entertainment audit in your own life. Because a lot of the entertainment that I enjoy and that you enjoy isn't designed to build and grow my relationship with Jesus Christ. Just the way it is. I like a Netflix series as much as the next person. 
I like music as much as many people. I like to watch movies just like you do. But I need to be honest with God because I don't want to take delight to dwell in, to become invested in the sin of other people just because it's not me. That was a heresy that the apostle Paul dealt with in scripture that Jesus dealt with. As long as it's outside the body, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm not doing it, it doesn't matter. I can be around it, I can watch it. It doesn't matter. And Jesus said, what we think is directly connected to who we are. So since we're going to be people who don't delight in evil or sin, I wanna ask you this question. Are you willing this week to do an entertainment audit? Now this is personal. If you're married, I encourage you to do this with your spouse because it's really good when you have the same guidelines. But are you willing to look at the things together objectively? To say to the Lord, God, when I watch Netflix or Hulu or Paramount Plus or YouTube TV or whatever it is you watch, watch it with me. God, when I listen to the music I listen to at the gym, driving in the car, whatever, Listen to it with me. I mean, he is anyway, right? It's just that we're acknowledging it. It's not like we're letting him in on this big secret. And he's like, thank you. I've been waiting. I mean, he knows, right? But we're sort of acknowledging. When I scroll social media, scroll with me. The Lord knows when I post on social media, post with me, right? Some of us, man, we torpedo our witnesses on social media it's so fast. That's a different subject for a different day. When I browse the internet, God, browse with me. What series do I enjoy? What music lingers in my mind? What posts do I stop on and interact with? What sites do I frequent? Do I delight in evil, in sin? And again, I'm not the church lady. I do not want you to think I'm out of touch. I do not want you to think that I'm telling you that all TV and all music, I mean, there was a day when churches did that, right? All non-Christian music is bad and you can't listen to that. If it has a drum beat, it's too much like the devil. And I mean, there was a time, you guys may not know this time, I lived this time. Movies were bad, no matter what. If they had a certain rating, it didn't make any difference. You couldn't watch them. And some people said Christians can't even be seen in a movie theater because after all, terrible things happen in there. And then it was bowling alleys. And I mean, we went crazy with stuff like that, right? That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is you and your own heart and your own conscience, you wanna be loving. And so you have to ask yourself by asking God to point out and reveal. And if you're married, I believe your spouse is involved in this. Am I? delighting in evil. I mean, it's no surprise or no secret that one of Paul's big concerns in Corinth was sexual sin. But gossip ran rampant. They had an elitism that was disgusting, a caste system among Christians, pagan worship. I mean, all kinds of issues, all kinds of ways they could have participated in the culture and said, I'm not part of it, but I'm still celebrating it. There's a fine line we walk as Christians being in the world and loving people, but not being so much a part of the world that we forget who we are. We're gonna come back in just a few minutes and we're gonna talk about delighting in the truth. And that's where the rubber really hits the road. But I hope so far, maybe I've given you some things to think about like I've had to think about myself this week. Okay, so I wanna tell you a story real quick and I gotta be careful because we're online. And um, I will tell you that I, I either have or I had a neighbor who either did or did not live close enough to my house to be able to hear my dogs barking. How about that? Um, and uh, I, I was with Joy, we were running an errand and, and I got a notification on my phone from my ring camera. You guys have a ring camera at your house, you know, when someone comes to your door, um, you know, the camera picks them up and, you know, it sends you a notification and you go, you can look and see who's there so you don't have to waste your time going to the door. Well, it also works when you're 14 miles away and that's where we were. So the notification went off that someone was ringing my doorbell and so I looked at my phone and all it was was an eyeball. And um, the, the guy was an old eyeball, I could tell. It was an old, 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 old eyeball, much older than mine. 
And, um, and he's yelling, your dogs are barking. That's what, he, that's what he's yelling, right? And so I waited for him to stop yelling, your dogs are barking, your dogs are barking. And, and I said to him, finally, I said, uh, sir, we're not there. We're uh, probably 25, 30 minutes away. Uh, I can't do anything about it. He goes, come outside and tell your dogs to stop barking. Uh, you know, I don't know if he understood how it worked or not. And he just stood there with his eye, like he had the clothes, like a peephole, you know, like he could see into my house through the ring camera. And he was, um, you know, not very nice about it. Now, my dogs don't bark. Uh, you know, I know everybody thinks their dogs are perfect, but my dogs are basically pieces of furniture. If you come into my home, my big dog, my poodle may look up from her recliner with her head over the top and give you a woof, you know, to just sort of let us know that you're there. But um, they're not guard dogs, okay? So this is very uncharacteristic. So I say to the guy through the ring camera, I don't think he heard me, if you would stop ringing my doorbell, the dogs would probably stop barking. He was very upset. He took off and, um, and I was a little mad about it, right? I was just, I was a little chippy. I mean, I've lived in the neighborhood, whichever neighborhood it was, the one I'm in now or the one I've been in previously for a long time and uh, long enough to have a good reputation and my dogs got along with everybody. So my wife and I, sometime later, were walking as we like to do in the evening and guess what had happened? This neighbor who was so upset about my dogs barking now possessed two dogs and they were barkers. And I thought that was the best thing that had ever happened to me in my life because, that may be a little dramatic, they weren't like close enough to like for it to be a nuisance, but they were close enough for me to say, Joy, I am going to his house and I'm gonna stick my eyeball in his ring camera and say, your dogs are barking. I was so happy that something bad happened to him. Now, could that potentially be delighting in evil and not rejoicing in the truth? Maybe not evil, although his dogs are pretty bad. Um, that's kind of sort of how we are, isn't it? It's like something bad happens to somebody and we talk about it. And we tell the neighbors if I'd gone across the street and gone, you know, that guy's dogs are so bad. And he was over at my house doing me to just become something far worse than what it actually is. So we don't want to just stay away from evil. Of course we do. We don't want to delight in evil, but we want to rejoice in the truth. So where do you get your truth? We'd already talked about Facebook, friends, family, former beliefs, all the ways we get our truth. The Apostle Paul, interestingly enough, had some really good friends. He had a friend, a woman whose name was Chloe. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you see that Paul, he wasn't in Corinth when he wrote this letter, was in a different city and Chloe sent some of her people who worked in her house to tell Paul about some of the issues that were going on in the church. Now, this is a very dangerous, dangerous situation because if you take your friend's word for the information that they're giving you, then, and you're doing something as significant as writing a letter uh, to a church that ends up being in scripture, and of course the Holy Spirit authorized this letter and endorsed it because it was true, um, you're putting a lot of stock in your friend. But how many of you have friends who you wouldn't really trust with the most important decisions that you want to make in your life? How many of you have friends that you would trust with something like taking their word to the point where you're ready to write a letter confident that it's God's truth? The Apostle Paul later in 1 Corinthians 16 talked about three special friends who came to visit him, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus. And he said that they came and they encouraged him and were true friends. They shared something. And if you're going to get your truth from your friends, and I'm telling you, truth from so-called friends divides families, it divides marriages, it divides churches all the time. I mean, it's as divisive as divisive can be. If you're going to bring people around you who you trust, and by the way, if you want to know the future of your faith, show me the friends that you keep close to you. It is amazing, amazing to me that outside your immediate family who you're supposed to spend time around, the people who you choose to spend time around, you become like them. So are the people who you choose to spend your discretionary time around, if your faith became like theirs, would you be happy? Would your faith be stronger? Would you be more the person who God wanted you to be? Those are the kinds of people we're supposed to pull into our lives. Nobody's perfect, but if you have friends with really good marriages and you want to have a good marriage, then the way they talk about their spouse, the way they treat their spouse, the way they want to spend time with their spouse rubs off on you and you and on them. If you have kids and they have kids and they enjoy their kids and they're raising their kids with godly biblical priorities, choosing the things of God first, and you're spending time with them, then you do that because it wears off on you and you and them. 
And it's the way that things are supposed to, well, they're, they're meant to be that way. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We're two stand back to back, right? You can't be as easily defeated. But if you want to look at the people closest to you, you're going to have a snapshot, a foreshadowing of what your faith will look like. And it's important. A true friend is somebody who wants what God wants more than they want what they want. Does that make sense? Do you have somebody in your life who's a close friend who wants what God wants for them more than what they want for themselves? Not do they say it, but have you observed it? Do you see it? Do you believe it? A true friend doesn't just want what God wants for them more than they, what they want for themselves. A true friend wants for you what God wants more than what they want for you or from you. And when the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the foundation for friendship and you can trust your friend to walk side by side through life and strengthen you as you strengthen them, then they are a trustworthy source. But unless and until, be careful because the people you keep close to you are the people you're going to become like. Now, you'll see in your devotions that I'm not suggesting that if you have friends who aren't believers that you just remove them from your life because that's not at all what you're supposed to do. We're supposed to be careful and cautious, but we're supposed to love the world and we're supposed to love people who don't know Christ. But if you have people in your life who say they're believers, but don't live like it and it's consistent and over time, the apostle Paul says, create space for the good of your own soul because there's an inconsistency that's diabolical and the chances are that they may not even be a believer in the first place, but the ability to camouflage and to live in both worlds, the world and the church, neither really are ne belonging to really neither one, not only is confusing, but it, it can be dangerous. Not only do you want to delight in facts that are true and people in your life who can give you these facts, but we really, and this is the point of 1 Corinthians 13, want to delight in God's truth, which are all facts, always true. Now, we have to deconstruct a little bit, as I mentioned to you in the first half of the time together, because some of us have come to believe things that aren't true and they've become hills that we want to die on. But you have to choose the hill that you're going to die on. There have been times in Christianity where every single issue was a hill to die on and we were ready to die for anything. And so we argued about everything and we became irrelevant. And the problem with somebody or a group of people becoming irrelevant is they're the last ones to know it, that everyone else knows it, that we're a joke, and then we only figure it out when it's too late or almost too late to do anything about it. And the Apostle Paul gave instructions to prevent it, and Jesus modeled differently than, well, certainly than that. But yet we fall into it because tradition is comfortable. Legalism is something that we can use to keep score. Theological elitism is dangerous, but appeals to our head and to our ego. And while it's important to know the truth and to stand for the truth, we have to be sure that when we take a stand that we are standing for the things that are worth standing for. And that if we're on a hill ready to die, that it's a hill and an issue worth dying for. Because we live in a world that's very confusing and very conflicting. And here is Jesus' principle. He separated the sin that we are not supposed to rejoice in or to delight in, and the person who deserves dignity and respect because they're created in God's image. Jesus never lumped people into a group, unless perhaps it was the religious, who very much wanted to be lumped into that group, but he saw people as individuals and separated them from the issue, which caused him to have a very unique way at least at that time, in being about the truth. Never once did Jesus delight in evil. But Jesus did not run into the world swinging a sword. Do you remember the first miracle of Jesus? I like the first, where he was invited to a wedding of a couple that nobody probably really cared about across the region. Of course, Jesus did and their family and their villagers but obscure couple in a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere. And Jesus had two choices. 
He could have rolled a rock with his disciples into the middle of the village. First day he got there, first hour, right? Stood up on that rock. Stop it, stop it, stop it. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. Stop it, stop it. Pointing his finger, pointing his finger, dropping the mic and leaving, going, boy, I witnessed to them, didn't I? But oftentimes that's what we do when we choose Facebook or we choose sometimes, if we're brave, arguments face to face. To think that we can beat and argue. To bully somebody into to the gospel. And we live in a time right now that's very, very divisive. Because there are issues that we deal with that most of us believe are not biblical, that they are against God's truth. We see them politically. We see them with celebrations. We see them in the news. They're everywhere. And we are faced with this very issue. How do we as followers of Christ not delight in evil, but rejoice in the truth. How do we as followers of Christ separate issues from people and love people and value people and assign the dignity to people that they deserve, but not walk any further into the issues than we need to? Jesus walked in. He didn't run in. And he didn't run in with a fist or a megaphone or a gigantic Bible smacking everybody he could reach. He walked in with an outstretched hand and he loved and he befriended and he believed in and he saw. And people looked at the way Jesus lived and said, how are you so different? And when Jesus responded, he responded with grace and truth, but he earned the right to share the truth by the way he lived. And in my mind, that's rejoicing in the truth, not picking every single little nuance to be a warrior for God, an Old Testament prophet, standing alone in the wilderness. Everybody's scared of you, but by goodness, you're, you're speaking the truth. Let's be like Jesus. There were many, many people who liked Jesus, who weren't like Jesus at all. Is that a, I mean, that blows your mind, doesn't it? I mean, the Pharisees, the religious were so busy waging war against anything they didn't agree with. And they're like, where is Jesus? He's supposed to be arguing with us. He's supposed to be debating. He's supposed to be posting. He's supposed to be attacking. And they're like, there he is. He's in the house of a tax collector with a whole bunch of sinners. And they lob accusations at Jesus saying, there you are, you're just one of them. He goes, no, I'm not one of them in the sense that I'm not delighting in evil, but I'm delighting in people. And the only way you do that is up close with an outstretched hand, not a closed fist. And so we have to decide, how is it that we are going to live? Because the issue, the hill that's worth dying for is critically important. I'll start off with something that nobody likes to talk about, but hell is real. And I say that with a smile, only to soften the blow of the words, because as you'll read tomorrow in your devotion, Adam and Eve started it, but you and I have done a pretty good job perpetuating it. We were all born with a sinful nature. And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Let me explain that. I deserve hell and death and separation. And so do you. But God, because of his mercy and his love, didn't give us what we deserve. He gave us Jesus to come and live a different way, to love a different way, to be full of grace and speaking the truth. Who took on my sin and your sin, the sins of the world, which by the way is the real problem. The symptoms 
The stuff we see, the things that aggravate us, not the real problem. They're the bait to get Christians distracted, to be combative, and ultimately to disconnect. But the real issue is, is that people need Jesus. Because Jesus took on the sin of the world and died a death he didn't deserve, my sin and yours and theirs, whoever the they are for you. And rose again, defeating sin, Satan and death and the claim that it had over us. So that any of us who confesses our sin, believes that Jesus did this for us and who he is and wants to follow him, doesn't just escape hell and is guaranteed to heaven, but is given a meaning and a purpose in this life. And friends, here is your purpose. How do you as a follower of Christ show love to the world you live in, to the people you are around in spite of the issues that you face? How do you remain a person of conviction who does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth? How do you become a person who doesn't delight in evil, but delights in people and is willing to separate issues and behaviors from the soul that God created that is eternal and so important? And your job and mine is to take this gospel humbly with an outstretched hand into a world and to love and serve so that God provides the opportunity for us to explain the difference, which by the way, friends, isn't anything good about me or about you. The difference is that Jesus saved us and that's it. And he'll save them, whoever the them is for you. All of us have different thems. There may be some of you in here like, yeah, them's the Republicans. And then there's some in here who say, yeah, them are the Democrats. And then there's some in here, everybody has a them. Can't believe a person's a Christian if they do this. And we're divisive. But what I'm trying to explain to you is could there perhaps be a bigger issue at stake? And how is it you're gonna build a bridge between what Jesus has done in and for you and a world who desperately needs this message. And friends, that's the most loving thing that you can do. That's what the apostle Paul was committed to. That's what he was training the church in Corinth to do. And that's what I want us to be trained to do as well. Love does not delight in evil. We delight in people. Love rejoices in the truth. So I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna pray that you'll live a life of grace. Grace and truth. Truth in love. And that as you leave footprints through this life, beginning today, people will see you the way you live, the way you relate to them. And they'll say, what is it that's different? And then you get to introduce them to your friend, to your Lord, to your savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you so much for my friends who are here. And I pray that today we would have embraced a few of these issues that are really hard to embrace from gossip, which should relate to all of us, to the entertainment audit that I know relates to all of us, to the friends we keep close to us, all building up toward the witness that we have in the world around us. We want to live and love like Jesus, but we are so far from Jesus. When I compare myself to other people, Father, sometimes I'm better, sometimes I'm worse, but when I compare myself to Jesus, I'm always found wanting, but I want to be more like him. I want us to be more like him. And I want the world around us to be able to see Jesus in us because of the way we love. And so as we finish this series up next week, I pray that when we put this period at the end of this 10 week sentence that we've been writing, that it would stay with us and profoundly change us and motivate us to let you use us to make a difference in this world as we're living out the rest of our life. And when we get to the end of our lives and we breathe our last, 
leaving this earth behind, we will open our eyes to the guaranteed reality of heaven and see Jesus Christ with his arm outstretched saying, welcome home, you did a good job. That's what I want. It's what I want for my friends here, for those joining us online. And it's why we're doing this, Father. So use us as you want, in Jesus' name, amen.